So today we've got uh, Laila Buckley and Wang Guo with us. I'll let them introduce themselves, but uh, to give a very brief introduction, uh, Laila is a senior researcher at the International Institute for Environmental Development. And Wang Guo is a professor at Bremen University of China and is also affiliated with the Beijing Pace Institute. And today they're going to talk about the dynamics and safeguarding practices of Chinese overseas hydropower investment and provide some insights into whether the practices are improving and what is sort of driving this. Uh, so, okay, uh, on to you, Laila. So, um, as Roshan said, I'm a senior researcher at IIED and I lead the China in the World initiative where we look at uh, Chinese impact on environment and development around the world. I first started thinking about Chinese hydropower about 20 years ago uh, when I wrote a paper about the Three Gorges Dam. It was several years before its completion. And in that paper, I argued that the Chinese government believed that it had to complete this dam despite serious social, ecological, and technical concerns that had been raised. And this was, I said, because it believed that there was a divine mandate to do so, to control the notoriously destructive floods and to calm the turbulent, impassable waters of the mighty Yangtze River. This had in fact been long been a dream of the Chinese leaders. In a 1956 poem about swimming in the Yangtze River, Mao Zedong wrote of turning a deep chasm into a thoroughfare through a vision he'd had of, of a, building a dam on the river while swimming in it. He writes, walls of stone will stand upstream to the west to hold back Wushan's clouds and rain till a smooth lake rises in the narrow gorges. The mountain goddess, if she's still there, will marvel at a world so changed. And here you see a picture that um, I took after the completion of the, of the dam. Um, on a, a, a very flat looking Yangtze River. So we see this symbolic power of hydropower, this very visceral sense of dams in China as a benevolent force for calming a nature that is unruly with leaders aligned with the will of the gods in doing so. And in this sense, I reflected that the Three Gorges Dam could do no harm in the eyes of the Chinese leaders and all concerns that were raised about the social and environmental impacts in their minds were technical issues that could be overcome. In the time since I wrote that paper, the Three Gorges Dam has been completed and it remains the largest dam in the world. And there's been an explosion of Chinese dam building outside of China. The China en Energy Engineering Group estimates that 70% of the global hydropower market is now held by Chinese companies. There are reported 320 large Chinese dams in over 140s, totaling, 100, uh, totaling 81 gigawatts of power capacity. Though Chinese dam building is slowing down globally, it continues apace in belt and road initiative countries, many of them least developed countries. Chinese dams will therefore play a key role in shaping the energy sectors, the livelihoods, and the development trajectory of these countries for decades to come. Though much has changed in hydropower, the hydropower sector in China in the past two decades, what we see is that dam building still holds a certain symbolic value for Chinese leaders. The working title for the research paper we're sharing today is Choreographing China's Overseas Hydropower Safeguard Stance. Two steps forward, no step back. This research focuses on social and environmental safeguarding of Chinese hydropower and LDCs with the goal of understanding the mechanisms for Chinese dam building and dam builders adopting new norms. When we were planning this research a, a year and a half ago, we originally planned to do field work on several Chinese hydropower projects in LDCs and to interview dam builders directly. Due to COVID, we had to adjust this to a desk focused literature study, but we also conducted uh, 15 researcher and NGO interviews to triangulate our analysis. I'll soon hand over to Professor Wang to give an overview of the trends in overseas hydropower, as well as an explanation of key Chinese actors in dam building, finance, and regulation. I'll then come back in to share our reflections on 
who is choreographing China's overseas hydropower dance and where the leverage points are for getting this dance to shift. But before I hand over, I just wanna note that the scope and scale of overseas Chinese hydropower is notoriously difficult to know. This is because project data is not generally disclosed by Chinese governments and banks. And also Chinese dams are not financed according to traditional definitions of development cooperation. And also so-called Chinese dam projects are actually a diverse set of different kinds of arrangements with different levels of Chinese involvement. We see build, own, operate, transfer, BOOT or BOT contract models. We see uh, Chinese involvement as project developers, either as direct or equity investors. We see EPC contractors, engineering, procurement, and construction. And we also see Chinese involvement as simple technology suppliers. The result of this is common inaccurate reporting on dam projects, including many dams that were negotiated, but ultimately abandoned. Dr. Shen Wei at IDS gives a really good detailed analysis of existing databases and their various strengths and weaknesses in his 2020 paper. And I would encourage you to look at this as we don't have time to go into that level of detail in, in the broad overview that we're sharing today. So Professor Wang, over to you and I'll stop screen sharing for now. Good afternoon, good morning, also good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so happy to join you uh, in this uh, webinar. Uh, I'm a professor in uh, Lumbi University of China. I was uh, working in the uh, World Bank for uh, like 20, 20 years. I'm an environmental economist doing research in economic analysis and uh, policy analysis. Uh, I have paid a lot of attention to the Chinese uh, dam, also global this, uh, dam construction. But uh, I have to be honest, I didn't do serious analysis before I uh, met with uh, Leela. And that's a couple of years ago, I met with Leela and we talked about this uh, project. I got excited. I said I should move uh, my analysis to this area. And uh, but just as uh, Lely said that uh, we didn't get a chance to to visit uh, some less developed countries, some or even uh, uh, talk with some uh, Chinese uh, dam builders, some um, managers. Uh, but in this uh, webinar, we can only share with you some general uh, background information, like um, dam construction by Chinese companies and uh, the, the, the actors and uh, some issues involved. And also uh, Lilo has also, as Lilo said, is going to talk with you uh, about the interviews with the scholars and uh, some, uh, some insight, some, some, some analysis. So at the beginning, I only have, um, I spend like 10, 10, 10 to 15 minutes to give you some general background information. First, I look at this slide. Uh, this is the hydro dams uh, uh, built by the Chinese companies in the less developed uh, countries. Uh, starting from year 2000, then to up to uh, the, the year 2019. And I count this number, total number together like 815. Uh, but as Lila just said that this include uh, this, uh, different types of uh, uh, investments. Uh, this, uh, you, sometimes it's not investment, just a, just a contract from builder. As, as you may know, this uh, Chinese uh, uh, build a lot of dams uh, within China, in total like more than 100,000, uh, including like 24,000 big dams according to this uh, international definition. Really, really much. I think uh, it's a kind of uh, experienced. And uh, now you can see that uh, this international market, that's a, 
uh, about like seventy percent of the international market. There's a Chinese companies. Uh, uh, there's a this a uh, uh, get this uh, market share like seventeen percent. But you may think uh, this uh, why so many dams built by the Chinese uh, in the world in other countries. Uh, my economists always think about this uh, like from the demand and supply. And the demand from this uh, uh, less developed country is also supply from this Chinese. I'm going to uh, not going to expand this discussion, and uh, uh, you may think about this uh, major factors in this uh, demand and supply. If you want to have some detailed analysis with regard to these uh, Chinese companies, uh, you may not be surprised. Most of the companies are state owned. Enterprises, the giant companies, all this uh, is a very uh, big. I only give uh, 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 several uh, names uh, uh, here, and uh, they have good technologies, and uh, uh, of course some finance uh, 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 very good, and they have strong relationship with the, the government, and also you may think you may know that this, uh, they pay more attention than other companies. Uh, they pay attention, more attention, <laughs> I said here, put more attention to reputation than profit. I don't know whether or not you agree with me. I didn't, didn't do the survey, didn't test this uh, hypothesis. And uh, this uh, state of is, uh, uh, of course, in China, this are uh, everywhere. Uh, they, uh, I would like mention that in like, uh, you know, 2010, the Chinese government reorganized organized this, uh, uh, state owned enterprises uh, just uh, uh, want to have a better service to this uh, international business. Government organizing involved, this, uh, I guess uh, it's uh, very easy to understand the Ministry of Commerce, the State Development Reform Commission, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, also Chinese two policy banks, China Development Banks, China Access Import Bank, and the State Administration of uh, Foreign Exchanges. Also, Ministry of Environment and Ecology. So, I have no time to explain the, the rules of all those uh, uh, government uh, sectors. Uh, I would like to have to spend a few minutes to explain to you this uh, procedures of all this uh, corporate investment overseas. That's uh, uh, in, that, in uh, 2017 by the uh, National Development Reform Commission. This actually is kind of like guiding this uh, behaviors of these uh, Chinese companies uh, uh, doing business uh, overseas. Uh, I list this uh, the, the, the general uh, elements uh, in red and for you to use to understand. Also, I would like to delete this uh, Chinese, I guess, uh, I don't know who you are. I guess uh, a thousand people. You, are, you you may have no Chinese, and you may uh, want to go some detail later. On, I can show you this uh, detail in Chinese. So I just uh, read this uh, major uh, 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 element. First, this uh, project approval. Now only this kind of registration, not like a serious uh, uh, approval by the Chinese government. Uh, only when those are uh, sensitive regions or sensitive uh, projects that should be uh, approved, approved by the government. Government can use this uh, online uh, investigation and uh, 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 some uh, mail, some uh, to, uh, also can use the public uh, report to supervise those uh, companies. And especially in this uh, article 41, there's a detailed uh, definition about the requ detailed requirements about these uh, companies. Should, uh, should pay attention to local norms, uh, mention uh, this uh, environmental social responsibilities. Also listed China's image is very, very important. They should, uh, should be a good image for all these companies, should be a good image for China's uh, uh, investment uh, internationally. And uh, they have this also system called, uh, let's uh, create China. They get all this information together and then get this uh, also information to the public. This information disclosure approach. They also define this uh, administrative and a legal penalty for those are violating these uh, uh, requirements. 
but I should know that this uh, policy document only issued in 2017. Before that, there's some policy documents, but not that uh, defined well. I later on, I would say that probably we can expect some kind of better performance from the Chinese companies after 2017. Uh, of course, there are series of uh, 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 policies on this uh, uh, environmental and social safeguards. I list here uh, first is the domestic ones, is uh, environmental impact assessment law and. Uh, also, this uh, uh, government issued some related to the environment uh, uh, for the specific hydropower sectors. And also, this overseas, uh, since uh, uh, 20, so 2007, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and uh, other organizations uh, issued some documents on this uh, international investment. And uh, you know, 20, 17 Ministry of, of Commerce and the Ministry of Environmental Protection give a guideline of environment, environmental protection for foreign investment and cooperation. And uh, in the year 2017, Ministry of Environmental Protection also issued the directives on the building green belt roads. So they have this, uh, 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 this uh, 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 if you read those documents, you can see that there's a gradual improvement of all these uh, policies. Of course, there are uh, two big uh, uh, policy banks in China. They also have uh, uh, policies on this uh, environmental and the social uh, uh, safeguards, the China Development Bank and the China Ex and Import Bank. I'm not going to go to it here. And of course, the Chinese companies uh, are investing uh, in uh, other countries. They also have uh, faced uh, some kind of uh, uh, standards, also pressures, uh, some of from other uh, uh, parties like uh, host countries, uh, uh, government, the laws and regulations, also local NGOs and uh, communities. Now also this uh, international ones like World Bank, uh, they, some companies adopt this uh, World Bank's guidelines on this uh, environmental social uh, guidelines, this uh, safeguard guidelines. And of course, the international organizations, associations, they, 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 uh, uh, they, they, they follow that. So here, just given this, uh, the characteristics of this uh, Chinese companies, characteristics of the Chinese government, and also this uh, international, uh, in, in, in international situations. And we can think of this, uh, what kind of performance that Chinese companies uh, uh, in environmental social performance of a hydropower investment. Unit. And uh, I would, uh, as, a, as a economist to the analysis, I, had, I have done a lot of performance analysis, environmental performance analysis, companies and different countries and this several countries. And uh, theoretically, the performance of this Chinese companies should be good. I don't know whether you agree with me. Uh, this argument is uh, uh, because they are big and high tech, a uh, good technology, good uh, financial situation, also committed to this uh, environment and uh, social impacts. And uh, uh, also this, uh, the, 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 uh, the image, image of the country. And, uh, and uh, I think also they pay, they pay more attention to these reputations and uh, that's probably. But of course, we found some kind of uh, failure, some bad performance uh, in the world. And also, when we do this analysis, we found that these uh, Chinese uh, companies, also government, uh, they have less international experience, especially with this uh, low social and legal capacity. And more, not many people there knowing this uh, international business, uh, knowing this uh, how to deal with the uh, local society, how to uh, deal with the, the, the laws in other countries. And of course, this uh, SOE is the most bureaucratic. So I found that in the past like 20 years, mostly they are learning and gradually improving. Also, as I said, that they should be much better 
perform after this uh, 2017 because the policy is already in uh, 2017. Uh, as I said that we didn't get a chance to do serious analysis, but I did read uh, several reports about this performance of Chinese companies. I I, I don't know whether or not any, uh, there's any person there from this uh, international levels. I think that they did have done a lot of good, good work. They have this uh, ranking, the evaluation of the performance of Chinese companies. I took a couple of pictures there. This picture showing this uh, seven Chinese companies, uh, its commitment to this, uh, uh, the, 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 in the policy, they committed to the social and environmental issues. They, they, rank, they have them overall rank, the good ranking, the two greens, and the two yellow, three red. I mean, it's uh, some good, some bad, right? It's uh, general, but, and the list is the final practice. Some green, two green, two, two yellow, three red. And I don't know what's the performance, uh, what kind of performance in other country. I saw this probably just uh, other countries uh, also similar. I don't know. I, I need a look. It's actually, let's say in the, in, the, in the next stage, I would like to know more about this. Of course, how to improve the performance of the Chinese companies. And uh, from analysis, you can see that uh, we need at least a uh, training, internet training capacity. Later on, later we'll discuss more about that. Also, I think we also need some kind of dialogue of mutual understanding. Of course, uh, this uh, better regulations and uh, monitoring enforcement effort, and also need uh, NGOs. And uh, all these uh, uh, recommendations, uh, I, uh, not just for this uh, to improve, not just for employment performance of Chinese companies uh, in the in, international in business, also within China, also I'll give this uh, similar uh, recommendations. Okay. Dila, I stop here. Uh, you please uh, pick up, and uh, after that uh, we can uh, answer uh, questions from the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Wang. If you could uh, stop sharing, great. Okay, I'll go back to my screen. Okay. So looking at these trends that Professor Wang has shared, we can make a few observations. First, if we remember Mao's poem about the goddess smiling down on the magnificent work of the envisioned Three Gorges Dam, we see that as Chinese dam builders began building dams overseas, they carried with them the sense that they were bringing nothing but good to other countries. And that uh, Professor Wang alluded to that in saying you would expect that, that the performance would be positive. Um, Chinese leaders also seem to believe that their dams could do no harm, requiring only that dam builders followed local laws for social and environmental safeguarding and dismissing the need to concern themselves with international safeguarding norms. These well-established hydropower SOEs do in fact give, the, 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 the fact that they are big companies and they're well-established give them advantages over international competitors in technology, in labor, in financing costs, and unlike these competitors, the SOEs are also not very risk averse or easily influenced by, by anyone outside of the Chinese government. Interviewees in our research emphasized that Chinese actors were therefore genuinely surprised with the widespread criticisms and problems that they ran into um, in operating building dams overseas. And these criticisms have plagued Chinese hydropower overseas since it began in the early 2000s. Some of these criticisms, they, they range from lack of community engagement, uh, lack of free prior and informed consent, issues with relocation, uh, problems with energy access and other benefit sharing, negative impacts on fisheries, biodiversity, freshwater resources, and more. Now, these complaints are not, of course, unique to Chinese dam building, but the leading role that Chinese actors have played in the last two decades, coupled with their disregard for international norms in, in the early years has fueled these criticisms. So from this, our takeaway is that some of the shift in norm adoption that we've observed in recent years has been part of a gradual learning curve on the part of everyone involved. The Chinese government has begun treating overseas hydropower with more caution and banks and dam builders are seeing that adopting stronger social and environmental safeguard norms make for better business. 
A second key point from these trends is that there is no silver bullet single solution. There's no single choreographer of the Chinese social and environmental safeguarding dance. And Professor Wang spoke of the collection of Chinese regulatory and governance bodies of policy and development banks and other financing and of SOEs with a business mandate, but also close alignment with government policy. So we see that the so-called Chinese overseas hydropower really as a sector, it lacks strategic overview and where the agency of the government is actually as important as the agency of recipient country governments and communities. Um, and that the importance of mandates from the Chinese government offices or safeguarding policies of Chinese banks need to be looked at within that context. To shift the safeguards dance then, we suggest that there are a set of four complementary pathways to generate improvements. The first pathway is strengthening the voice of host country governments and local communities. We see that the stronger the sustainable development planning, as well as the legal and regulatory regimes are in a host country, the better placed countries will be to enter into contracts with Chinese actors that reduce environmental and social impacts of large dams. Crucial to this, of course, is strengthening the voice and agency of local communities and civil society to ensure that their interests are upheld in local policy planning. We go into some detail in the paper on how contract types affect social and environmental safeguarding in Chinese dams. And we don't have time to go into that here, but we'd be happy to discuss in more detail in the Q&A if there's interest. The second pathway to norm adoption is building the capacity of SOEs, as well as the transparency of the sector as a whole. I said at the beginning how researching this subject is notoriously difficult. And then there's also the, the, the learning curve that both Professor Wong and I have, have reflected on of, um, over the last 20 years. Chinese SOEs have been learning through experience, but there is still room for skills building to improve the social and environmental uh, abilities, capacity, and responsibility of China, Chinese dam builders. The third pathway is creating clear rules to guide a cohesive government policy in China. The 2017 NDRC um, procedures that were released that Professor Wang just talked about is a, a giant step forward in that direction. Um, the weak governance of Chinese overseas activity has really been a challenge across all sectors from the beginning of China's going out policy. But in hydropower in particular, because SOE conduct is so closely aligned with government policies and because Chinese hydropower is dominated by SOEs, which is not true of, of all sectors, there's really an opportunity here for government leadership that is stronger than in many other sectors. So with more cohesion, the Chinese government can send clear signals on the need for adopting international social environmental safeguard norms. The fourth pathway is reforming, reforming finance to drive responsible hydropower. Despite an increasingly robust framework in Chinese finance in terms of ensuring companies follow safeguarding, there is always a gap between principles and enforcement. And two potential ways around this challenge that have emerged from this research um, are one better risk assessment, which would potentially create a space for insurance companies to act in an additional gatekeeping role. And the second is potential for improvement through collaboration with other financiers through trilateral finance mechanisms. Now, it's important to note that these four pathways um, are really underpinned by the role of social mobilization. So whereas the pathways are these specific points of leverage, social mobilization has really acted as a main driver for greater recent adoption of international norms by Chinese dam builders. It has in fact been the effective actions of local communities in host countries and supporting advocacy, advocacy groups that have incentivized both local governments and the Chinese actors involved to adopt safeguarding norms. It works because as Kersher et al. explained in their 2017 paper, it makes the cost of not adopting safeguard norms higher than the cost of implementing them. So in closing, I wanna focus on the third element, which uh, Professor Wang also went into in some detail with his discussion of the NDRC procedures 
released in 2017 um, or updated in 2017. Um, I'd like to explore that that element, but from the perspective of the efforts recently to green the BRI. So the Belt and Road Initiative is this broad framework um, in which uh, a lot of the Chinese companies are uh, being encouraged to operate overseas, including hydropower. And from the beginning, there's been a lot of concern about these investments and these projects, which focus a lot on uh, infrastructure development and, and have social environmental impacts in, inherent in, in the sectors that are involved. So from the beginning, there these concerns ha have been met with some talk of this idea of greening the BRI. And since it was established in 2018, the MEE, the Ministry of Environment and Ecology, has been pushing and really at the center of, of these discussions of greening the BRI. But MEE hasn't had any actual authority to govern overseas activities. And we think that it might have found a way to address this gap in governance in a way that other ministries haven't, haven't been able to. And this is through recent recommendations on setting up a traffic light classification system for BRI projects, similar to that required by the equator principles. In a report that came out last year that's now circulated among ministries, the recommendation is that projects be divided into three categories based on positive and negative impacts. There are red projects, projects at risk of causing significant and irreversible environmental damage or major negative environmental impacts, and these require strict supervision and regulation. There's yellow projects, which are environmentally neutral projects with moderate impacts, and there are green projects, which are those encouraged. In this system, hydropower projects are to be automatically placed in the red category. Classification can be upgraded or downgraded, so long as the project adopts sufficient environmental management measures to mitigate negative environmental impact and promote the realization of environmental objectives. According to our interviews, this uh, document is now being actively circulated and commented on among different ministries, as well as among bankers and NGOs. And it seems that me wants this system to be used as an effective ban on new coal and possibly also hydropower, unless those hydropower projects can be built and managed and designed according to new standards. So of course, there will always be gray areas, even within with the best of intentions from Beijing, but we see some hope with this traffic light system that it could re be a real game changer. Up to this point, we haven't seen anything really formal outside of the NDRC approach that could act um, in a legalistic way to regulate overseas activities. But this uh, proposal could really act as a meaningful gatekeeper for harmful projects. So with that, I will close and thank you for your attention. We're finishing up our paper this month and we very much welcome your questions and suggestions for this work. Sorry, thank you, uh, Ellen Wong. Uh, it was a lot of information, but uh, really interesting. I'm gonna jump right into the questions. We've got Anton, I believe, uh, there are first. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Hi, yes, hello. Uh, thanks a lot for a really, really interesting uh, presentation, uh, both from, from uh, Lala and, uh, and, and Wang. Um, firstly, um, I think, the fact that China has been so successful in hydropower development in Africa, which is the region I know, is something that Africa is extremely grateful for in terms of the amount of generation capacity that China has added. It's immensely compared to what happened through any other mechanism. And I think that leads to the point that, you know, in your first uh, comment on shifting the dance, you say, you know, you want to strengthen the, the voice of the local government. I see local government, host country governments as very willing participants in this dance with Chinese companies. This, they are not victims. They, the fact that this Chinese system of delivering hydropower is orders of magnitude bigger than any other hydropower specific uh, development mechanism in the continent show that it works well. It works well with the weak institutions that we have um, with the weak civil government or, or voice of, 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 um, of, of, of the civil society. In that context, it all works 
really very well. And I think uh, we need to balance that with the aims of shifting. And that was what prompted my question, you know, or the thinking there is, will China gravitate towards the methodologies that are followed by um, a, a, a lender financed, project finance type of, of, of hydropower projects where you need to comply with IFC standards, very comprehensive social environmental impact assessments, um, uh, dealing with uh, local communities and, and so forth. Um, and I would say that, you know, uh, they are, it, it's unless we get uh, um, the, really the financing side and the structures on from the Chinese side that are backing these projects to uh, implement other um, approaches, we will still find very many host country governments in Africa very willing to go this approach, um, which has been promoted in the past by, um, by Chinese companies. Thanks. Should, should we do a one by one or take a set of questions? With... You're muted, Roshan, sorry. <laughs> sorry, uh, I think we've got some time for one on one. Uh, okay. this one. Uh, Professor Wong, do you, do you want to take a first uh, I, in answering? Or? Uh, I, I, I totally agree with uh, this gentleman's uh, comments. And I think uh, there's a strong demand and also appreciation from the local uh, countries and local communities. Uh, here, because of our paper is on this uh, social and uh, environmental social safeguard, and uh, we just uh, uh, pay just ask people to pay to to, to improve this. Okay, I totally agree with uh, this person. Yeah, um, I I too would would agree, um, Anton, uh, in terms of the the role of the host country government, and we put it in there because it is important. The fact that they are complicit it is part of the the, the problem, um, and I didn't go into detail in what my comments, but you know, the strengthening the local communities and, and the mobilization that, that where we have seen that be effective um, has been really important in improving, you know, the, the safeguarding approaches. I went into this research also assuming that financing was key and, and a few researchers say that that is really, you know, it, we need to focus on the money. As long as the money is controlled, then, you know, these projects will improve. But I think for me, a key push back to that, that message um, that has emerged through this is, you know, that the role of SOEs being distinct from other country um, hydropower actors where in many ways, these hydropower projects are pushed forward even if they don't make financial sense, even if they're not going to have a good return on investment because they are agreed at the highest level of you know, diplomatic relations between countries. And so that's where I, I land on, it's actually a combination of all of these different things. It isn't that finance is the thing we have to focus on and only finance, um, but it's, it's very much you know, a strong signals and mechanisms from the government really matter because we're dealing with SOEs who are not just companies focused on profit. Specifically, your question about whether or not the methodologies will be adopted. I think China's in this process of trying to figure out what leverage, you know, if we agree that we want to improve the, the safeguarding, how do you do that? And I think there's skepticism that the existing methodologies are, you know, work well. Um, uh, Judith Brakeman, who I think is on the call, um, has written about, you know, the shifting landscape in hydropower around the world and how the existing um, very slow financing mechanisms haven't worked well, they have problems as well. And so, you know, it's not a straightforward solution to just look at financing and just adopt, you know, have Chinese actors adopt um, international practices. Jeez, thanks. I think Patricia, you had a comment to that. Uh, and if you'd like to say something, I can respond. All right. Uh, me? Are you talking to me? Yeah, sorry. I didn't oh, know if you okay. wanted to add to that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, uh, let me just uh, put on my video here. Sorry. Hi, everybody. I'm sorry that I, I joined so late. I was in another meeting. I'm a director of the International Water Law Academy at Wuhan University. And I've been doing 30 years of international law and sort of, you know, uh, just recently looking at uh, the rules of international law that apply to hydropower and to infrastructure. And we're, we're um, let me turn on my light here. We're discovering that, uh, you know, the uh, interface between international investment law, finance law, and the rules that apply to transboundary waters and international environmental law really need a more rigorous um, uh, consolidation and evaluation. We're finding lots of, you know, and this is just coming at it from the international law perspective. And I've worked in China now for maybe about 20 years. We started up the Xiamen China International Water Law Group in Xiamen. And Xiamen University is known for its excellence in international investment law. But when you looked at the particular issue of hydropower, and especially from China, that's mostly an upper riparian state with all those, you know, Sort of feeding all of the transboundary water major river systems uh, across Asia, we found that from the international legal perspective, there are gaps and there are things that we need to, to look at. So we're looking at that. As I say, we're on the case. Um, I really appreciated the presentation so far. I agree, yes, it's a combination of things, but from our disciplinary expertise, I think we need to be a bit more rigorous in identifying the rules that apply at the national level, the regional level, the international level, and try to identify a list of best practice. And so we're trying to work on that. So I'm, I'm excited to be here today and I'm learning a lot. I came a little bit late into the game, but I saw the last two presentations. So thank you very much. You're all welcome to Wuhan or if you have any international law questions, I'd be happy to put those two people on my team who knew more than me. So thank you very much for in including me. Thank you, Patricia. It's great to know about that work. Thanks, Patricia. Uh Let's see, I think Judith was next. Let's see Judith and uh, Joshua's questions uh, together. Um, and then Judith, why don't you? Yes. Sorry, was that me? Yeah, sorry, Judith. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Sorry. The dog's just trying to greet the postman in a rather unhelpful fashion. Okay. Um, yes, I just. I have a concern about the idea that we push all of this responsibility back on, on the Chinese. When I feel that um, the Chinese have always said that they would implement whatever standards they were asked to implement. Now, yes, it would be good if they asked for better standards, but part of the problem, and this really links into what Anton Louis said, part of the problem is the fact they're not being asked by the developing country governments to um, impose higher standards than they are. And even to the extent that they are asked to impose higher standards, the um, countries concerned don't have the capacity to ensure that those standards are upheld. And I think until we address that capacity gap and the understanding of the need for higher standards, um, we can't just push all of this onto the, the Chinese end of the transaction. And I think in, in that sense, we also have to be careful about wishing for something like an equator principle framework in that the equator principles was a lot about saying what you would do, but it was very little about checking that you did it. And um, we need to make sure that whatever is being implemented is also being verified and checked. And part of what takes the multilateral development banks so long to prepare and finance a project is the need to ensure those standards are in place and then check that they're being implemented. That was it. Thank you. Sorry. Can, should I come in? Did you say somebody, you wanted somebody else to come in first or? Uh, if we could do, I think we've got Joshua next and if you guys could answer both, if we've got a blue chief in the end. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Josh Clem. I'm the policy director with International Rivers. Um, yeah, just some some maybe quick quick thoughts and and maybe a question. Um, you know, I think this question about uh, the financing, you know, the standards of the financiers. I, I think 
you know, we, we do see that that's, um, you know, still quite relevant and, and critical in the projects that we're following. Um, you know, the, the point was made about, you know, Chinese companies accounting for roughly 70% of, of projects being built today. So obviously that's not only Chinese finance projects that includes World Bank projects, IFC projects, et cetera. So I think what we've seen is that, you know, as, as others have pointed out that, uh, you know, companies tend to, you know, hew to and align with the requirements that are asked of them, whether it be by borrowers or by financiers. So, you know, I, I do think that's, you know, increasingly, you know, it's, it's still quite relevant. Um, but what it comes down to in, in many cases, I think for us is, you know, really the question of uh, risk profile and, and risk threshold of projects. You know, whereas the World Bank may, uh, you know, decide that a project is too controversial or uh, the impacts will be too severe in a given country, you know, they may not be involved. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe another Chinese, fi Chinese financier or sometimes a, you know, a, a borrower or a, a host country will decide to self-finance. And so then, you know, in these cases, it's really important for the uh, SOEs to, you know, really have bottom lines about what types of projects they'll get involved in and, and what they, what they're not. Um, you know, and I, I guess, I, my question in some ways is, you know, what, uh, you know, in, in your research, have you come, you, you've spoken about, uh, you know, some improvement over time with the adoption of these norms that you have fewer, uh, you know, problematic projects. I'm wondering, I guess, what, uh, what evidence you, you have for that? Because, you know, I think we've seen even in the last one to two years that, you know, some of the, you know, very problematic projects that are uh, under underway in Indonesia, uh, in different parts of Africa, that these are, you know, projects that, you know, 10 years ago, um, you know, would, you know, would also, would still have been supported or, or companies would have been involved. And, you know, I think we're, we're not really seeing that, you know, there are types of projects that companies are not getting involved in. So, you know, Tanzania, for example, the, the Stiegler's Gorge Dam, Sino Hydro is the, um, you know, subcontractor for a billion dollars worth of work. This is, you know, internationally decried, you know, this type of project. So I, I guess I'm, I'm hesitant to accept the idea that, um, you know, the risk threshold has necessarily changed too much. Um, similarly, um, you know, there's a, a case in, in Guinea in West Africa, the Kukutamba Dam, where Sino Hydro, the same company, uh, is contracted to build this dam that would kill uh, upwards of 1,500 uh, critically endangered chimpanzees. And, you know, the company, as far as we can tell in our discussions with them, is fully ready to uh, proceed with the project. But actually, it's a China Exim that was expected to finance the project that has now gotten cold feet after you know, uh, scientists and conservationists raised concerns about the biodiversity impacts that you know, they've pulled the plug or have basically decided not to proceed with the project. Um, so at least as things stand, it's not going forward. So you know, maybe just to point out that you know, as much as you know, it is ultimately you know, the, the companies that need to you know, have firmer bottom lines and, you know, critical, you know, no-go type projects that they'll, you know, just won't consider in the first place. Um, you know, it, a lot of it still comes down to the, to the financiers, even, you know, 20 years into, you know, the China going out strategy. So sorry it took so long, but just wanted to share some of those thoughts. Um, I lost the last couple sentences of what Joshua said. I think it might be an issue on my side. Um, Professor Wong, I'll go ahead and, and just give an initial response. If that's okay. And then you can come in. Um, 
thanks to both of you for your for those thoughts. Um, I'm glad, Judith, that you push back on this idea of putting um, the the onus on the Chinese, um, particularly because that is not what I mean to say. So if that's what I've said <laughs> and that's what you've heard, um, point of clarification that um, the entry point for this research was looking at the role of Chinese actors. And you know, a lot of our analysis focuses on that. It is questioning what can Chinese actors do, companies, financiers, government, civil society. Um, but that is not, the conclusion of the research is not to say that's the only thing we should look at. Um, you know, with my background in China and Professor Wang's um, expertise, that was something we felt we could, you know, analyze and, and offer. Um, so that's a point of clarification. I, I really appreciated, Judith, your um, analysis, um, research that you've done that I, I looked at for this study on, um, you know, existing how the multilaterals um, operate and and the kind of challenges and and you know the benefits and the the downsides of existing approaches um, and how the Chinese and other new financiers have come in um, and I guess I, I kind of want to put a question back to you maybe not we don't have time for it today but maybe we can follow up which you know is I agree that in a way that slow process, you know, that the multilaterals take to do those careful checks and, and verify that, you know, um, practice that policies are actually being implemented in a way is the only way to ensure that, that dams aren't incredibly damaging to communities and environments. Um, but then, you know, all the issues that you have uncovered in your research is why that isn't workable. And therefore, you know, this gap has, been created for new financers to come in is kind of, it, it just ends up with the situation of, well, where do we go from here? So maybe we can take that that forward um, together. I'm sorry, I haven't really answered a question other than kind of more questions back. Um, Joshua, I would point you to um, a paper, Kirscher et al. 2017. Um, he, they very much make the a strong case saying that Chinese safeguard norms of SOEs have changed significantly in the past 15 years. That's K-I-R-S-H-H-E-R-R. -R. Um, again, limitation of the research. You know, we this paper isn't about let's show that Chinese um, safeguarding norms are improving. We had to go on existing literature, which is saying that, and interviews, which, you know, broadly agree. The title of, the working title of the paper is, um, you know, two steps forward, not one step back. One of the interviewees suggested that generally norms have improved, but it's a process of two steps forward, one step back. And we're sort of saying, how could we you know, have it not be one step back, what would that look like? And here's some indication that um, the norms are, are improving and we can't verify that based on the limitations of our research. Anything you wanna to add to that, Professor Wong? I uh, generally agree with uh, the points raised and uh, also know that uh, some studies showing is that Chinese performance are improving. But I think also uh, still lack of uh, research and I need, uh, I guess, think uh, at least more, more research in the future to, to, to analyze the performance of the Chinese companies in, uh, in the past. And of course, also uh, need some kind of analysis uh, just across countries, <laughs> it's, uh, not just the Chinese companies, also with uh, this uh, international, you know, in, even compare with the World Bank. The World Bank, uh, of course, the risk uh, uh, rules, they, 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 they uh, uh, reject a lot of uh, uh, sensitive projects. Uh, but of course, in, in China also, it's, uh, nowadays, uh, Chinese, uh, uh, in the Chinese policy, you can see that they also would like to avoid uh, those uh, controversial ones. It's uh, very, really, really risky to their reputations. But sometimes the Chinese still take those uh, risks because of the local 
needs are local from the, the strong demand from the, 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 the local governments. But I think they just need a, we need a, a keep just expand the research, uh, look at the past, uh, also just look at the current situation. Just keep, keep an eye on, on, on this and uh, find the problems and uh, give some suggestions to Chinese, also in the national communities, also local, com local governments to improve them. Okay, great. I think uh, one, but time for one last question from a little thief. Um, th thank you, Professor Hong and uh, Lila. This is a very uh, interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I am a PhD student uh, at the Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology in Halle, Germany. Uh, I'm working on environmental rights uh, issues. Uh, uh, in southwestern part of Ethiopia, where we have a, a, a Chinese-funded uh, uh, dam, um, so I have I have two two specific questions. Uh, so one is, you know, you, you have suggested one of the probably uh, significant actors in this kind of dance is civil society. Yeah? So for the potential role that civil society can play. Uh, have you considered regime type in your analysis? Um, regime type, I mean, of course, LCDs or L, like least developed countries come in different shapes and forms. Uh, and the potential for civil activism of any meaning, uh, I think will depend on the regime type. So if you have taken that into consideration, what is your finding uh, on that front? Um, the other one is uh, the issue of international relations especially with regard to projects affecting multiple countries, uh, especially with cross boundary rivers. If the dam, you know, we, for example, like where, where I'm from Ethiopia, uh, we have uh, projects, some of them really, really controversial. The Chinese are involved uh, one way or another, for example, in the, the, you know, probably many of you know, the Great Renaissance Dam, uh, where the Sudanese and the Egyptians are really concerned. So how much of you know, international relations considerations or political considerations, geopolitics play uh, you know, other than the simple, you know, basically, or the kind of the relatively scientific social and environmental impact assessment, even though, for example, projects are assessed to be less risky on these accounts, uh, are decisions to finance or provide other technical assistance for these projects, is it affected by you know, international relations considerations? Uh, or have you, have you considered that in your uh, research? Or if so, what's your, what's, what's your insight? Thank you. Great questions. Um, I feel like we could talk all day about those two issues and we are out of time. Um, the short answer is we don't go into detail on either of those points in the paper, um, but I very much look forward to reading your uh, research because um, both of the points that you made really resonate. Um, I think there's a gap in, in the literature and the research. Um, absolutely, you know, the, the role that civil society is able to play is, is dictated by the regime in which it exists. and. Um, there, I have come across and didn't write in the paper, but um, you know, in looking at what role has civil society played in different cases, and you know, in Myanmar, it, it, it looks quite different than it, it looks in Kenya, or and it's, um, I think that would make for a really fascinating paper, specifically focusing on that question of, you know, what channels for civil society in impacting. The safeguarding um, practices and outcomes of, of dams. Um, so we we unfortunately sort of have to gloss over that a bit in in you know making a broad statement that civil society social mobilization has played a key role and point to other people's studies that have looked at that in more detail. Um, on the international relations point, um, again, it isn't a focus of our paper, but I agree with you completely, and I think particularly with the with Chinese. Um, dam building, it matters a lot because of that role of SOEs being so closely linked with Chinese policy. So 
you, we see cases where you know often the dams are a product of the these um, geopolitical relations between China and the country and they're pushed forward even if it maybe doesn't make sense for a lot of other reasons um, or you know the, the flip side of, of dams sort of making sense for maybe economic or energy profiling reasons but because the international relations are not um, suited then it, it, they don't they don't go forward so to agree with your point and to say I'm sorry you probably won't find more detail in in this particular paper but fascinating work and I'd love to stay in touch I'll close uh, I, there um, okay. Professor Wong final <laughs> word to you <laughs> I, I agree with the Lina's answer there's a two great questions but we cannot uh, provide a good answers. And uh, of course, this uh, survey of society is, is uh, very important. And uh, uh, we need to uh, uh, improve that uh, kind of their rule in this whole, 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 whole game. And uh, uh, in our paper, we, we, we will point out that. Uh, uh, with regard to those uh, 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 dam constructs, uh, in, in fact, uh, this uh, cross border of uh, different countries. This uh, really uh, uh, very sensitive. Uh, this regarded as a, a very sensitive project by the Chinese uh, uh, policy. They would like to mostly avoid this kind of uh, uh, situation, but only probably some special uh, situation they may decide to get involved. Mostly, they would like to 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 to, to leave that aside. That's just my my addition to this uh, Lila's uh, answer to you. That's all. Hey. All right, thanks, Professor Wong. Uh, we're a few minutes over time, so I'm just going to uh, wrap it up by thanking uh, Lila and Professor Wong, who's uh, glad both of you could make it. Uh, Professor Wong from DC all the way there. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, great presentation and the discussions were really good. Uh, and also to let you all know that the next Future Dams webinar, we're doing it on 23rd of March. And uh, David Hume and Barnaby Dye, both of which, uh, Professor David Hume and Barnaby, both of them are in Manchester. They're gonna be talking about stakeholder engagement in river basin planning, uh, future dams guide. So it comes out of the work from uh, what we've been doing here uh, within the future dams team for the past couple of years. So mark that date in your calendar and uh, to look at more of what we're doing with the future dams research, uh, futuredams.org, our website has a list of all that stuff. So thank you again, Laila and Wah, and um, uh, sorry, Professor Wang, and thank you everyone for attending. Thank you for some thank great you. questions. It's great to discuss.